Hey, welcome back. Well, you've survived a zombie horde, and you've survived a... Well, an alien who likes to hunt humans. Who likes to be invisible sometimes. So you should pat yourself on the back. But let's see how you fare against the giant primate. We're gonna watch King Kong from, uh... Way the fuck back in time, 1933. I don't usually watch old movies, but this is one of my goddamn favorites of all time. And I think you'll see why. Uh, there's a saying that goes around that says, anybody that's ever made a movie is just doing what they can to make The Wizard of Oz. And I would say there's some truth to that. But I would also say it's very true that a lot of people that are making movies, even today, are still trying to make King Kong. Uh, this movie was huge. Not just the ape itself. Uh, it was a very expensive movie. Uh, it was the first movie that went into production for a uh, brand new studio, RKO Studios. Uh, David Selznick wanted something, something big to represent this new studio he was opening. And uh, they could not get funding for this movie anywhere else. So uh, Ernest B. Shodasak and Marion C. Cooper... Uh, they were friends with David Selznick, and he wanted he wanted to spend the money because he wanted something larger than life. And God damn it, he got it. He got it with King Kong. Uh, not the first time that uh, a monster was featured, uh, a, a giant monster was featured in a film. There was a movie in the early 20s called The Lost World where a giant brontosaurus took over London, England. Uh, and, you know, he, he doesn't take up a whole lot of screen time. Not like this. This was really the first time where... The special effect was really the star of the film. And if you really look at the lineage of just your summer blockbusters and your blockbusters in general, King Kong kind of really set, set the bar pretty high for what that was going to be. Uh, it came out amidst, right in the middle of the Great Depression, so people didn't have a lot of money. So what Miriam Cooper wanted to do was give some people kind of a spectacle. And one thing you're going to notice in this movie is that the premise seems absolutely fucking ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's, it's a film crew that's just going to go out to the middle of nowhere where no white man has ever been, and they're going to just film stuff and somehow make a movie out of that. And you kind of think about how ridiculous that sounds until you realize that's exactly what the uh, two filmmakers who made this movie did for a living before King Kong came out. Uh, Ernest B. Shodasak... And Mary and C. Cooper, they were partners back in the 20s. And they'd go to exotic locations and film exotic people living their lives. And then they'd take it back to the States and have some editor who work his magic and make a story out of it. So it's not too unbelievable and it's not too unrealistic for the times. Uh, this is way before the film industry was exactly that, a, a, an industry that we understand today. Before there was really a process and rules to making movies. Uh, this movie is just a blast. Uh, you know, it's aged, it's dated, you know, you're gonna have to forgive some of the special effects, but you also have to realize that this particular style of special effects, the stop-motion animation, it was pretty much our primary source for monster effects and creature effects that had to be, you know, bigger than humans, or even smaller, just, it, it was used a lot for a very long time. Uh, this movie was obviously a huge influence on Ray Harryhausen, who would go on to do, like, uh, Jason and the Argonauts and all those kind of movies later in the 60s and 70s. Uh, this movie is important. One of the most important movies of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Horror or not, just any genre. And I don't even know fully if you'd call King Kong a horror movie. It's got elements of horror. It's got, it's got a lot of... It's got a lot of doom and a lot of and a lot of like gruesome shit going on, but I guess it's more of an adventure movie at heart, which you could probably say the same about the other two movies that we watched today. Uh, once again, it takes place in in a jungle. We're going back to an island, actually, uh, Skull Island, to be exact. Although the t the name Skull Island is never given to it in this movie, I think it was Son of Kong, where they finally called it Skull Island. There's a little mention of Skull Mountain, but. Uh, which it's uh, supposedly off the coast of Indonesia. So we're traveling across the ocean again today. Um, part of it takes place in New York City, uh, which is pretty much what King Kong is known for. We've all seen that image of him on top of the Empire State Building, swatting the biplanes and 
getting shot down. I think everybody knows how this movie's gonna go. No spoilers there. But, uh, yeah, it just, this movie's a blast. Uh, it was made uh, before the Hayes Code. Uh, the Hayes Code came along about a year later, so then what we're going to watch today is pretty much the original release. Uh, supposedly there's one scene missing that was shown to one audience in Pasadena once, so I don't really count that. I would call this the complete version of it, but oh, some of the stuff that was cut, uh, you're going to see uh, there's a scene where King Kong is peeling off Fay Ray's clothes. That went after the Hayes Code. I guess what, the other thing you need to know is that this movie was released several times. It was so popular that it, about every six, eight years it, it was released again to the point where it was released in 1952, almost 20 years later, uh, and it was it, it was considered one of the better movies that came out that year. So that tells you something. It was extremely popular. It made a lot of money every time it was released. And as I said earlier, it was released during the Great Depression, and it still made... $90,000 its opening weekend. You gotta realize a movie ticket in 1933 cost you about 35 cents. So, you know, that, that was just what they wanted to do. They wanted to give people something to uh, just forget with the, all the drama and all the horrible shit that was going on around them. And I think they succeeded. I think they succeeded. Uh, a lot of people uh, kind of look, you know, if you look at this movie through sort of a modern lens, you can see this maybe got some racial undertones to it. And, you know, I would come to this movie's defense in a lot of ways. First of all, it's filmed in the 30s. Uh, if you notice that all the islanders, even though it's supposed to be off Indonesia, for some reason the islanders are African or appear to be African. Most of those actors are actually African Americans, if not Native Americans or... Mexicans, so that you know, they tried to find dark skinned people to portray the, the natives of Skull Island, which is better than throwing a bunch of white people in blackface at you. Uh, you know, and you know, this you could look at this movie a hundred different ways. Uh, I don't think that there is any intentional uh, racism happening in this movie, and in fact, by the time you get to the end of it, you know, who's really the villain in this movie? I mean, I'll leave that to you for you to decide, but. Another thing is, you got to look at this movie and realize, like I said, it's kind of autobiographical. You know, they're sort of writing about themselves. Uh, even to the point where uh, Ernest Chodasak's wife, uh, Ruth Rose, she was the last person to touch this script up. So, if you kind of look at the Faye Ray character, most of her dialogue comes from Ruth Rose. Uh, so, there's uh, some, some things going on here where they don't want a woman on the boat in the beginning. It was kind of considered bad luck for a really long time, obviously, to have a, a female on your boat for some reason. So, uh, but she met Ernest Chodasek on a boat. That's how they met. They were going, he was in the middle of filming something out in the middle of nowhere, somewhere on the ocean. And that's where they met. Uh, Faye Ray, uh, she's basically what I would call the, the original scream queen. I mean, she does a lot of screaming in this movie and she's really fucking good at it. Uh, while she was filming King Kong at the same time, on the same set actually, uh, she was uh, also filming The Most Dangerous Game, which is another, which is another early horror thriller from, uh, from that era. Uh, so she had to do a hell of a lot of screaming there too, uh, and uh, I think she earns her keep here, for sure. Uh, a lot of iconic moments in this movie, a lot of iconic moments. Uh, yeah, I don't know. This is this movie's this movie's big. See, it's just the only word I can keep coming up with when I start talking about King Kong. It's fucking big, uh, and we all know who King Kong is. I mean, this is just uh, one of those uh, one of those characters that will never leave our culture. It's just part of who we are now, and we exist in the world of King Kong. I mean, there's a remake after remake, and uh, some good, some bad. Like I'd avoid that one from '76. Peter Jackson one is pretty good. It runs a little long, but every every frame of that movie is gorgeous. And then you got Skull Island most recently, which is probably my favorite adaptation of King Kong. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's something, King Kong is something unavoidable. We all know it. All right, well, here it is, 1933, King Kong. Thanks for watching, guys. Have fun. Enjoy. Be safe. Does it smell like bananas in here to you?